Hello everyone, Master Zion 1001 here, and in this video, we'll be going over the changes that have happened for HardOps 987 underscore 13. For the most part, this was intended to be a small quality of life update. However, as you can see from the release log, it has been quite expansive for this particular round. The main thing of note is the improvements with set origin and to shape, which I'll be going over in depth, but also dice V2, which is something that's been long awaited, adding a new feature of voxelization. Box cutter notifications have also been expanded, providing even more information and new bevel profiles have been added for new users to try out instead of having to come up with something on their own. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into this release log and see what's in store. So whenever you're first using hard ops, pressing Q and bringing up certain operations like sharpen, you'll see display a notification at the bottom center of the screen. Other operations are, for example, clean mesh. We see that it'll display information pertaining to the operation at hand. However, there is a degree of customization that can also be done with notifications. So if we were to press Control K, we could actually bring up our hard ops preferences where we can jump over to the UI tab. And if we expand on the operator options, I want to talk about operator background and operator border. So background, we'll put a background on the notification and border will put a border on a notification. So if we press Q and we press sharpen, we see that we now have a nice little border in addition to a shaded background. However, whenever you're using box cutter, you'll see that box cutter doesn't actually have any sort of information display because it isn't pertinent to the operation at hand. However, because of the success with the operation notification system inside of hard ops, we did add a toggle where underneath your hops drop down and under the opt-ins you can turn on box cutter notifications and when you turn on box cutter notifications you can choose if you want your drawing to show up in meters centimeters millimeters inches and so forth for us we'll be setting ours to just meters and if i begin clicking and dragging we see that there's now a notification display on screen anytime that i begin performing an operation in fact i can begin extruding it'll notify us of extrude i can press tab pause it press X and change it to a slice, so it'll notify us that we're slicing. Press X again, we're now intersecting. Press X again, we're now insetting. However, due to the complexity of this, insetting isn't gonna work out so well. So pressing X again, we're back over to cut, and that is the simple box cutter notification in action. However, if we were to click on the hops drop down and we click on this button on the far end, we can also get extra box cutter notifications. And this means that during draw, we now have additional information. For example, we now have information talking about our orientation. We're currently oriented to the object. We're currently working in local. We're currently doing a non-destructive cut operation and there's actually one modifier in place on this model. So if we click and apply, that means that whenever we click and drag, it says that there's one modifier, but the moment that we perform the extrusion, we can now see that there's now two modifiers because the modifier doesn't actually get added until we perform the extrusion process. Another thing showing in this notification is the fast under Alt E. So if I were to press tab and pause this, I could press Alt E and we could change our solver from fast to exact on the fly. I find it's important to know what solver you're using because if you're using exact without being aware, you could experience unnecessary slowdown. And sometimes with fast, you could be going for a certain type of operation that might be more optimal for exact, but without being aware, you will be in for a bad time. So just letting you know that there's an option to have the classic simpler notification, but there's also an option to have more information showing on the notification for this update. Another thing is in my videos, you might notice that my, auto, that my notifications have a hint of pink when it comes to them. Underneath the hops drop down, you can change the modal background color to pretty much any color you want. I always choose something a little subdued just for a relaxing experience whenever I'm using box cutters. Sometimes I'll go with something a little blue, but generally with this particular computer, I opt to pink just because it just has a little bit more vibrancy to it. But just letting you know that just on the fly, you can always just go in and change your color just on the fly by going under the hops drop down to go for that particular mood. In fact, as I look at it, I wonder what if, what if it had the color change according to the particular operation that you're performing inside of Box Cutter, but you know what, that's a talk for another day. From now on, in the event that you are adjusting a object using a modal bevel, similar to you see me doing here, even if you've never created a custom profile, you'll be able to press Shift P and just begin scrolling through custom profiles inside of hops as you see me doing here. 
So just happy to announce that there's now custom profile support just built in by default to hops along with some presets that users can get started with. In the event that you have a custom directory of profiles that you wish to deal with, by pressing Control K, we can bring up the Preferences Helper. And jumping over to Properties, we can expand the Hardoffs properties where there's a toggle underneath Bevel Defaults for Default Profile. So by unchecking this, you'll be able to have it use your profile directory that you have specified. But otherwise, if you've never set up a profile nor intend to do so, just having this checked by default, which is already enabled, should allow you to just select any edge, bevel it, even in edit mode, and then just press Shift P to begin scrolling through all the various types of profiles. So there's even an MX profile in there in case you're looking for that type of profile, but all sorts of profiles are there for users to go in and experiment with. So in order to set up an example for us to use Select Tool, let's just press Q, go under Mesh Tools, and we'll use Sphercast, Control A, Visual Geometry to Mesh, we'll press D and change over to Circle, and we'll just cut a quick circle, press B, in order to bevel, press Shift F in order to flip it, and just give it a larger ring. Let's press Alt V and look at the wireframe, but let's press Control A and apply the Visual Geometry to Mesh, which applies all the modifiers, so if we select this face and press Control Numpad Plus to grow it a couple of times and then Shift Tilde, we are basically at this point where we've selected what we want. And when it comes to Shift Tilde in edit mode, I actually have it mapped to select boundary loop by right clicking and just having it marked to the hotkey of Shift Tilde because I'm a big fan of it in edit mode. But from here, if we press Q in edit mode and we look at mark and we look at the tool tip, it says that shift clicking it will bring up the edit multi tool. So let's shift click to jump us into what's called select tool. If we press B, we can now bevel this edge, which we can either press spacebar and apply, which is good. We'll go ahead and do that and let's jump right back in. But this time we'll press M and jump over to merge. So with merge, unlike select, which we just use to uh, perform a quick bevel, you can select two points and just quickly merge things. You can also click and track. This was something that was previously not working in Blender 3.0, so I'm happy to announce that it's finally been resolved to an adequate level. So now users will now be able to get in and use select tool just as they're seeing here. In fact, anytime I make a mistake, I just press C to remove it. In fact, sometimes whenever I'm using select tool, I'll press spacebar in order to apply my progress and then do things manually that just aren't capable of being done while I'm inside of this modal. Uh, for example, sometimes some really tricky cleanups require that I exit, but for the most part, a little dragging will um, help you sort some areas out pretty quick, but I'm a big fan of the select tool. So whenever I heard that it was broken for Blender 3.0, I realized that was something we needed to resolve with the quickness, but this is a moment in which I press spacebar, press two to go to edge mode, dissolve that area, let's press one, look at an edit mode, and we see that you know these areas aren't even laying on top of each other. So let's right click this, subdivide, select these two pieces, merge, last, and everything's looking good there. However, this area was looking a little questionable, and it's the same thing, we have a little piece overlapping so let's select that select last merge at last dissolve whatever was there and let's continue on with our merger thon so by shift clicking mark we can enter into the select tool and if we look at the help on the side it says that by pressing m we can jump over to the merge tool and so we'll just do that and it looks like we have some other areas that we probably need to uh, perform an exit clean on but we'll come back for them so just sliding things over to other things, just cleaning things up in a real intimate fashion is how we chose to approach it whenever it comes to merge tool. However, of course, uh, solutions for entire loops and things like that are always um, in contemplation. But before all of that, there is a degree of um, fine control I feel is needed, which is what we are establishing first with this, the ability to just get in and, you know, with the technical eye, be aware of what you're doing and perform these actions very quickly before we, uh, you know, start taking the steps and the guesswork out, making it an automated process. 
you know, anytime we jump straight to automation, it opens the door for user reports of issues and shortcomings because, you know, not every situation can be automated, but definitely allowing fallback methods to be done to really get in and intimately deal with these things in a, in a controlled fashion is our goal. So here we are, this area has now been cleaned up so I can press Alt X and just mirror this to the other side using symmetry because it's all destructive, Alt V, turn off wireframe. And just like that, we can now see select tool working properly in Blender 3.0. In fact, this area is an area I would still be looking at. You know, an interesting thing about merge tool is that besides being able to select two points to merge them just like so, we can also hold shift and create geometry in between. So here we're just, you can also slide when you're in merge. So I'm holding control and basically sliding geometry around. So in addition to being a consolidator cleanup method, you can also use it to kind of slide things around. So, you know, when it comes to the future of merge tool and what it's supposed to be, I, I definitely see a lot for it as far as the future goes when it comes to us refining what we got and turn it into a true multi-tool that's uh, versatile. Right now, it's like a tool made up of various modes, but I feel that there can be one mode to rule them all that performs every operation. So as we continue on with these things, I hope to see those components come into their own and finally recombine in a redesign to finally be that all-in-one multi-tool for topological reconstruction that I've always envisioned it could be. And there we go. At least now we have a little bit better of a surfacing job happening there, just solving the geometry with a little bit of sliding. So to show some of the enhancements with set origin, we will press X and delete this cube and shift A and add a torus. We'll go in the F9 menu and we'll press uh, major segments to be 36. We'll leave these at 12. And really I can just look at this in top view not even press Alt V until that everything is set up 48 purposes for this example. However, we'll select in edit mode, we'll also press Alt S to just push it up a little bit. And I'm just gonna select just this loop by Alt clicking it, press Control I and delete everything else. And from here, I am simply going to just select every other face. And since I have Mesh Machine, that means I have to press Y twice in order to rip it off. If you don't have Mesh Machine, you can just press Y once and it'll already do the split for you, but make sure you have split enabled in your preferences if you want split on your Y key. So with these now split, I can press P and split each of these into loose parts. So now each of these pieces is split apart by a separate face. So if we press Q, we can go under Set Origin and you'll notice that if I drag and drag out my dot and it becomes a line, there's now an axial display. So we can see that the default axis is now set to X in addition to it displaying the fact that it's X. In the future, I wanna be able to pause this and have users be able to dictate exactly what sort of axis is being specified via scrolling. However, for now, it's important that we at least establish a baseline axis that we're dealing with whenever it comes to dealing with set origin. So currently it is set to X. And right now you see me kind of going rapid fire just using the last dot in order to just jump off and create a flat X facing axis. And this is important for me to just show some of the enhancements with set origin in action, but also to set us up for the next slide. So almost there. And of course, keep in mind, you can always just click a dot to just specify your origin. But for me, I have a lot more fun clicking and dragging to drag a dot out and specify the actual direction of the axis. So now that we've covered everything, that in a nutshell is what has happened with set origin for this release. However, if we were to press Control Alt Q, let's see, Control Alt Q, we're now in quad view. Even though we don't need to do this, I just wanted to show that we can also now use set origin in quad view and there'll no longer be any issues whenever it comes to um, having things work. This was something that we dealt with on the box cutter side as well, having our dots work in quad view. So having a system derivative of those dots not work with quad view was something that I found to be a bit of an anomaly. But in a nutshell, that's just some of the changes that have taken place with set origin for this particular update. 
So here I have my torus from the last example where you can see I've split it up into separate pieces and they all have their origin set up, which is important for this next part. So another thing to keep in mind is keep an eye on the hierarchy that's going on in the outliner when we're going through this next phase. So if I select everything and I press Q, O, T, it would bring up two shape 1.5. And we could press spacebar in this mode because we don't want cube, we actually want empty. And if we control scroll, we can actually jump this to origin, which is our first maneuver. But we also want to press I because we want to individually deal with each of these objects origin. The other thing is that we want to shift scroll in order to change the empty type and then press S in order to scale. And then from here, we can press P in order to change the parenting. So now we have the empties parented to the torus, but we actually don't want that. We press P again to get an invert, and we see that all the components of the toruses that we split off are now parented to the empties. So now we basically have some localized place empties that are now the parents of this entire region, meaning that if we were to press RXX, this piece will flap as so. And same with all of these pieces. So let's just shift A add another empty, and we will just right click this and adjust our size. Let's press F2 and use Blender's rename to just call this prime empty, just for simplification. And in a nutshell, that is our localized individual empty support added to this latest version of HardOps, along with the ability to also orient things to the origin points, which is just a new way to approach to shape. So in this particular update of hops, you will now be able to bring up the control tilde helper and the constraint helper will actually function just like the constraints that you would normally deal with on the other side of Blender. Of course, whenever we deal with our pop-ups, we don't get access to the eyedropper, but just letting users know that we also now support the ability to deal with your constraints from the helper as you see me doing here. Previously, it was locked to the bone constraints, which I'm not sure why that was going on, but we'll just map this from the location of Z from let's say zero to 0.5 and we want to map this to Z to the X axis. So that's going to be this one. And we want to set it to 180. And by unchecking map two, we can see that it collapses. The way that we draw our constraints is a little bit different from the way that you see them drawn in the actual helper itself, where we see that these are expandables. So it does give me the idea that maybe we could probably draw a different version of this that's more optimized for our needs of setting up this particular type of constraint because I find myself doing it a lot. But that aside, back to the matter at hand. So we see that the constraint didn't quite work out and that's because we need to set this to rotation and then give it something like 180. So that way we're rotating at 180 and not translating at 180. So from here, we'll look at everything in top view press B, draw a box around everything, select our main empty that we've given these constraints to, and we could press spacebar, just type in copy constraint to selected objects. Now everything is constrained and we have all these dotted lines connecting it. In the event that you don't like these dotted lines, you can just turn off relationship lines, which is something I like to do. But now whenever we move this up, we see that all of them are rotating. So I've just been doing this example lately, just being a little random. But to show in action how I rebuilt the rest of the torus, I'll just press Control G to make this a collection. And we'll just call this part torus. And from here, we can just shift A and bring in part torus. And let's press R, snap it 10. Looks like all we have to do is snap it 10 because of the amount of segments. Let's grab all three of these, R, snap. Looks like increment snap's gonna be good to us. Sometimes when you get your increments just right on your divisions, you'll be able to just get in and rotate them just like you're seeing me do at this time without having to contemplate the in-between numbers. So I'm just selecting this one instance that wasn't needed. And another thing is we can just hide this empty at this time, press B, box select everything, right click, choose to lower our empty size for these collection instances because there's no need for us to have these little sticks sticking all the way out in space. We'll shrink them down, press Alt H to reveal our empty. And basically this is what we created. So a little random, but I don't know, just a little fun with constraints. I'm always 
contemplating the next thing I could be doing with constraints because they're just so fun inside of Blender. But just letting you know that in the event that you're dealing with constraints, control tilde will now allow you to deal with object constraints on the fly, similar to how you would normally do in the constraint panel. So Array V2 is capable of dealing with two different empty methods. One of them is driven base and one of them is object base. And because of that, they have different results whenever it comes to recall capabilities of Everscroll. So I'll just take this cube, scale it down, and we'll scale it out. Just turn it into a quick little stair. Control A, apply to scale. And we'll press Q and jump into Array V2. If we press X, we can change the axis where I can set this to Y. And if we press Shift E, we can actually exit with an empty target. And that means that afterwards I can actually drag this empty down and reposition it in order to rotate and change the way that this array actually results using this object as an offset. If we select the object and we go over to the array and we look at the object field, we see that there's an actual field for an object and it's actually filled in. So if we take our empty and hide it, we could pre say press Q, go under operations, go under modifier scroll, and if we were to say shift click on the word array, it would bring back the target and hide it, which is something that would be expected. However, let's right click and cancel. Let's go back into array where we basically break outside of our circle, getting rid of that target. And let's just press E and not shift E to exit with a driven empty. So this one is actually a driv driver based empty, meaning that if we rotate it, instead of it rotating the array, it actually changes the count. So it's a more versatile way of dealing with the array as a post effect using an empty, but isn't using it in an object field as you would expect. So right now it actually is. So if we press H and we hide it, we could press Q, go under modifier scroll. And when we tab to expand it out into the dot UI, if we shift click, it will now bring back the empty associated with that as well. So there's been a change to the way Array V2 works where now the array target is actually populating the object offset field, which will allow it to be recalled. So this was something that I personally ran into and just found a little bit odd because I definitely want to recall anything that's a modifier that's active that has an object field that's able to be recalled. So to show this in another context, if we press Q and go under add modifier and we were to say add a lattice and we hide our lattice and we go under modifier scroll and we press tab we can shift click on lattice to reveal lattice and just as easily we can shift click on the array empty to bring back the array empty even if it's driven. So whenever it comes to dice in action, the funnest way to show it is with the cube. We'll press S, X, 2, scale it out. And with box cutter active, we'll just draw a box and perform a cut. Press D, jump over to circle. Press A in order to make a new shape. And we'll just cut there. Press D, jump back over to box. Press W in order to wedge. Perform another wedge in the back. Press D, jump over to circle. We'll draw a circle shape. Press A, make it a separate object. You know, we could also draw one here. Press A in order to turn it into a make. And we could press Alt X to mirror this to the other side. Select this cylinder that we added. Select this shape. Press Alt X, mirror it to the other side. And if we press Alt V E, we can go into EVHQ, just getting a little bit better of a presentation. And, you know, before we continue, since we're in dots, we could hold control and jump off of this point, but we want to be in box for that. So let's just jump off of box and just create a quick wedge and let's just select everything, but we want our box to be the main selection. So if we press Q and we go inside of dice V2, we see that we're able to begin dicing on the X axis. So we'll press T in order to activate two twists, which means that after we click, it will dice these objects, join them, and then put us in the twist 360. So to show that in action, we'll just click. And here we are adjusting things inside of twist 360. And that really in a nutshell is how you have fun whenever it comes to using dice. You just create a quick shape, dice it, and everything should be joined for you automatically, smart applied, allowing you to twist it. And then of course, just like I did a moment ago, delete the end faces so that it joins nicely. And that in a nutshell is how you have fun with dice. So for this particular update, we also rewrote dice because there are things that we want with dice that was not possible before. So let's just press H and hide this object. 
and shift H and hide a cube and talk about dice in action. So whenever it comes to dice, you're probably familiar with being able to go into dice, moving the mouse in order to change your axis, rolling the wheel in order to change your segment count. However, in addition to being able to dice on individual axes, you could press Y to add another axis, and we're scrolling the wheel and we're adjusting all of them at the same time. We could even press C and cut on all the axes at the same time. However, one of the limitations of our previous dice was we didn't have the ability to control individual axes. So if we press Tab, we're able to expand out the new dot UI that's now a part of the new dice where we can actually adjust individual axes whenever it comes to dicing in a more intimate fashion. So really, this is just scratching the surface whenever it comes to this dice, but our goal was to try to make it as similar to the previous version of dice, keeping everything that made it great as possible, even the ability to scroll through your text, toggle on the ability to see through, and the ability to smart apply and even change your algorithm between knife project and mesh intersect on the fly. Keep in mind that the hotkey of Q is still kept for that. And one of the best parts of it is that if you hold shift, you see that the icon for complete turns into twist 360, meaning that if I were to click to complete, it actually will put us into twist 360. So a nice little visual cue, just letting us know that afterwards you'll be jumped into twist 360. But for the most part, all the behaviors that you are used to with the previous version of dice are kept. For example, We'll just insert a new cube. If we press Q and we hover over it, we see that the tooltip is pretty much almost the same. Uh, you're still able to dice on left click. You're able to two dice or dice using a secondary object on the first object on shift. And you're able to control click in order to dice on all axes, which has now been upgraded to a technique called voxelization. And also alt clicking to smart apply on your way into dice is still there. So if you're just one of those people who you know, you're working and you have a ton of modifiers and then you want to dice, but you don't want to have to think about the process of smart applying and everything in order to perform your dice process. You can actually just do that by, you know, alt clicking it on the way in. So I can select both of these objects, uh, basically alt click dice, and I don't even have to think about anything. I can just click and know that basically both of these objects have received a nice dicing. In fact, we see that this cut did not work out, so let's control Z and undo that. And this is a perfect example of why dice actually has the Q key for us to change the algorithm because some algorithms will have issues. For example, knife project works good with singular selections. Sometimes even 2D selections work better. However, with objects that are comprised of multiple objects that are intertwined with each other like we're seeing here, mesh intersect sometimes can work a little bit better even though it can have some limitations with certain other types of cases. So whenever it comes to dice, results will definitely vary. Keep in mind that there are multiple algorithms whenever it comes to using dice. The major goal with the rewrite of dice was the ability to perform what's called voxelization or the ability to have an object that's irregularly shaped and be able to get square cuts all around without having to fiddle with every axis individually. So to show that in action, this behavior actually takes control of the control click behavior for Dice V2. So if I control click, we see that the ticks are actually dynamically changing as I'm scrolling up and there's actually one segment counter at the bottom. This indicates that voxelization is on and whenever I click to complete it, we actually see whenever we press Alt V that basically everything is an equilateral box. I mean, not a completely perfect box because it can be a little variable with the segment counts in between, but definitely a lot more boxy than it was before and having this sort of result allows you to do things like say add a lattice and give it additional resolution say maybe on the y or the x-axis and we can just get in and deform this object actually very easily without having to go through a lot of work so I mean even if we had a bunch of boolean cuts we could still voxelize it and be able to deform it pretty easy to shape this into a form that we could you know, put on the side of a robot's head or something. But really, voxelization is kind of an early concept. So I'll more than likely have to do some pickup content just going over in depth exactly why it was needed. But, you know, it's it's a thing now. So it was one of the things on the to-do list, and I continuously pestered the coders about it, saying, hey, I need this to be a thing. We had it as a thing on the box cutter side, where basically whenever you cut using the knife grid, which was shown in the last release log, that part is actually kind of our attempt at voxelization inside of box cutter. 
However, the solution truly belongs on the hop side. So right here, I'm just creating a really simple shape, just having some fun with box cutter and we'll just press T, give this some thickness, maybe draw a shape here, cut inside, bring it to the other side, let it clamp with the AccuCut tab, press J. Look at this area, realize we need to press Alt E in order to change our solver, maybe from fast to exact. Sometimes it's really hard to tell. We'll press B, bevel it, space bar. And you know, you can always tell when these cuts work out is if you go under modifier and you put a decimate, if it cleans it right up, if it cleans it up, then you know that it was nice and flush. Otherwise, you probably are gonna to need to uh, check into that. So with this mesh, we can just control click on dice to jump into boxalization, which boxalization isn't needed for twists, but if we were trying to just get squares all around, then this is the way that we would want to go. In fact, we see that in this example, let's alt click. And it's because the modifiers were not applied is why it didn't work out. So let's actually try that again. We go under, let's control Z undo to bring ourselves back. And we go into dice and we see that, hey, dice isn't actually calculating correctly. And that's because there's modifiers that are unapplied. We can actually see that in the bottom left corner of the screen. And one of the ways that we can deal with this is looking at the help, we can just press S and that will smart apply it, getting rid of all of the modifiers. And now we see that the dice bounds are actually being calculated around the proper form. So from here, we can actually press B and go into boxalization. We can actually boxalize this area and get a very nice boxy result without having to go through and deal with all of these settings individually. I mean, you know, whenever it comes to our operations, you know, the smart apply is one of the options here and it's quite popular. However, having it integrated into things like sharpen where you can actually have it replace C sharp if you want via preferences or integrate it into dice in the form of being able to apply things just to get a better calculation inside the tool has definitely proven to be a smart decision whenever it comes to getting the most versatility and not having to say have these moments where you're like oh snap I gotta right click and get out of here and go under operations and smart apply you know that sort of versatility is definitely one of the things that you know plants crave so Hopefully users can find some use out of these latest features that are found in this latest update. And, you know, we still have more improvements to come whenever it comes to dice. There's a reason that we rewrote it and it's because we want to add additional dice systems that definitely are more shader based than they are based off of actual geometry. So, you know, we'll be talking about that at a later time. Whenever it comes to hard ops and lattices, there's really two types of lattices. There's either a linear lattice or a B-spline lattice. So if we press Q and we go under add modifier and we choose to add a lattice, we can now press F9 and have a option for our lattice style to either be linear or B-spline. B-spline is a lot more gradual whenever it comes to deformation, it can be a lot smoother. However, linear gives you a one-to-one -one control of your object whenever it comes to controlling it using a lattice. So let's actually change this over to linear using the F9. And with that, we can actually just grab these four points and move the shape all the way down. And this is something that we cannot do with a B spline situation. In fact, it'll just fall short. So we'll select this, go to the lattice settings and just change all of these to B spline, just to show in action the differences. And we see that whenever we move it, the object remains offset somewhat because the lattice is just a little too kind to the mesh. So sometimes you actually want to be very cruel and have very hard control. And in those cases, you have a linear lattice now available in the F9 panel whenever you activate a lattice using hard ops. So I figured I would exit on a note of some stairs because I did stairs in a previous demo. Might as well just show how easy stairs are as of now. So we'll just scale this object down a bit, scaling on the X and Y, you know, um, press Q, jump into array X a couple of times, maybe roll the wheel in a bit. We'll press E to exit with the driver. The nice thing about the driver is it actually puts it at the very end from here. We can just go into box cutter, but press control X to jump over to knife 
and we'll just grab this face and extrude it down. From here, we can just press QOT, press spacebar, convex hull. We'll control roll in order to place it precisely on the other side of where we created it. And I'm not sure why this is here. SX, we'll grab this area as well, but we wanna press B for box select and not draw with knife. And SX, and we'll press F on that too. Control shift tilde or control shift tab and set our vertex snapping. So when we press GX, we can hold control and actually snap that. And from here, it's just a matter of us pressing GZ, GY, taking that point, dissolving it, choosing to mirror this over to the other side. We're just going to delete these because I don't know what they are or where they came from. But just like that, I've made a set of stairs. And so we'll press Alt VE, have a little fun with it. You know, let's pretend like we have about three minutes till the bomb explodes to have some fun with the set of stairs. So we'll just get in, perform our typical box cuts, pressing T to do a fake out at the last minute to turn our cuts into just panels. We'll press T on this area as well. Press Alt X, mirror to the other side. Then we go in with our follow-up, our trusty wedge, not even holding control, now holding control. And just performing a couple of wedge cuts and because of the power of sorting, all the details are already transitioning over to the other pieces. So, so far so good. And now we can actually select this piece on the side, press QOT, press spacebar, but we'll change it to a plane. And by moving the mouse, we can actually set what we want our shape to be uh, rotated to. And we also want to place it here, but we actually want it to be placed on the unmodified other side. I'm pretty sure there's a key inside the modal that would have got it precisely to the other side, but really it doesn't matter. We'll just eyeball it, get it into place, select this bottom piece, delete it, Q, go under bevel, press two to switch to vert bevel. We can bring this piece down. And I think I still want to lower that bevel just a little bit. But let's, you know, let's also bring this piece in. Let's bring this down. I was about to create a very straight rail on a very angled set of stairs, which would have been a mistake. Let's control click Smart Apply. You might be wondering why I use control click on Smart Apply instead of mesh tools, uh, converting it to a curve. Uh, under Curve Extract, and that's because Curve Extract would leave the original mesh behind, but Smart Apply will actually just replace the object altogether with the curve that I aim to replace it with, just giving me my final result. Sometimes I think about that whenever I'm going between the two, and I'm like, you know what, today's the day where I want to actually Smart Apply it and get rid of it completely, versus actually dealing with it in a more intimate sense. So, you know, whenever it comes to the side piece, this piece is nothing we can just get in do a slice select this piece run a smart apply grab this edge gz snap it here put a big bevel in it grab this piece bevel both of those edges and you know we're just having some fun just doing some uh random cutting to just add detail we see that it didn't propagate to the other side that's fine because we can select this piece select the piece we want to mirror across Alt X and it's just game over for that. So, you know, instead of even solving what was going on with the GOT the other side, we'll just mirror it and just never talk about it again. Just a little testament to the power of mirroring now. Sometimes I use mirror in such an abusive fashion where I'll just mirror over some things it's like, yeah, yeah, we don't care what's what's under there, what's the truth there anymore, because we could just replace it with what's on the other side. And if this mirror doesn't work out, we can just add a mirror on top of it that will actually work out uh, precisely to the way that we want or even have it oriented to an empty. But just like that, we create a nice little set of side stairs to end this note on, you know, just uh, wanted to create something as a final demo and why not just revisit the stair concept one more time. In fact, we see with this piece that, you know, I aimed a little too high for the sun. We're gonna need to, give that back, but that doesn't mean that we can't come back and give this a little wedge action. And just like that, we've created a quick set of little side stairs. So it would be a missed opportunity if we didn't at least dice and deform this shape. So with everything selected, I'm just 
selecting everything with A. In fact, let's Alt H and reveal even the empty. Let's have the empty in the selection just to you know make it extra silly and bring up dice and we see that dice is just a okay that's actually old dice so we'll press control tilde and under dice options let's set our dice to version 2 and we're just not going to talk about that and let's go into dice v2 where things actually behave as they're supposed to let's press s in order to smart apply and we're going to press T in order to twist afterwards and we click and this is basically our result. So we got now some uh, twisted stairs. In fact, the cool thing about twists is you could press R and rotate the shape inside in case you want it to rotate differently. Like now I have these stairs going inside and even cooler with twists is you could press shift D and duplicate inside and it'll flip it for you. So now I have these uh, flipping staircases kind of going opposite directions. It's getting real random with it. Of course, with these, they've just gotten so deformed so badly that they need to be readdressed. And by readdressed, I mean, we could actually go in and grab this object and scale it accordingly and it would actually change this final result into something a little more acceptable. In fact, uh, kind of something I used to always do at DICE is I would turn on all the display modifier and edit modes, or I believe it's this one. We want to display in edit mode. So now when I press SX, even though it looks like I'm adjusting it in a deformed state, I'm actually adjusting the original one in its original state. And we can get that to look just a little bit better and for the other side, I mean, you know, this thing's a tragedy. So just pressing SX and scaling it to anything a little more acceptable is a little more acceptable than what we were looking at previously. However, we may want to scale the top out a little differently. And even with this one, we can see the difference of what, it, what it's like whenever we don't have all of these checked. And now we can get in here and grab this one, grab this one, but we'll press period and use individual origins. So that way we don't have to do this twice. And let's just press SX, scale it in until it's appropriate. Maybe something about there. Let's shift click on auto smooth to, you know, raise the auto smooth amount. But we see that if we get too close, we start messing with our cylinders. So it's really just a fine digit there, whatever it comes to dealing with these things. But just to end on a more random note with our stairs, just getting in here and just dice and twisting it. 